Good morning, Connecting Point. So good to see you today. Would you stand to your feet as we sing? Uh, thank you for joining us online. And uh, just a reminder from a couple weeks ago, we're going to sing about this in just a moment. God is fighting for us. Amen? That's good news. Amen? Let's praise God for that this morning. And let's sing about it. That's a great way to start today. Here we go. Not flesh and bone. You are not weak or slow. You're everything brave and bold. You're fighting for us. Amen. You are not distant or cold. Your heart's not angry or closed. And even in ways we don't know, you're fighting for us. comes to your children you fiercely defend us to we stand delivered you're fighting for us always fighting for us you've never closed your eyes you've never been surprised they been whatever war may rise you're fighting for holy rage and all your miraculous ways we simply stand here amazed cause you're fighting for us fighting for us you won't hold back when it comes to your children you fiercely defend us to we stand delivered you fighting for us
Well, good morning. I'm Pastor Brad. I'm one of the pastors here, and we just want to thank you uh, for joining us and worshiping with us this morning, whether you're here with us in person or if you're at home watching on one, many of our, one of our many online platforms. Uh, we just want to know. We're thankful that you gave us some of your time this morning or joining us. If you're online, Carly will be hosting you guys in the chat today, so just make sure uh, to tell her hello, thank you, um, interact with her. We want to encourage you guys to continue to use um, our central hub. If you're here with us in person, there are QR codes um, throughout the worship center and in the entryway. If you're watching online, there will be a link provided for that in the chat. Um, and that just takes you to our central hub where um, can kind of get you all things connecting point. If you need to contact a pastor or have a prayer request, um, as well as our giving tab and some past sermons will be on there. So we just want to encourage you guys to continue to use that um, and check that out. And we also want to encourage you, especially if you're watching online today, uh, if you're on Facebook, go ahead and click that share button. Um, and help us expand our reach. And if you're here with us in person, uh, you can go ahead and pull out your phones too and go on Facebook and click that share button um, and just help us spread uh, the gospel today. I know last week uh, there's lots of people in my life uh, that could have benefited from hearing Pastor Doug's sermon last week. And we just believe that that's going to be true this week too and that God has you here for a specific reason and that God has a message today that needs to be heard uh, far beyond uh, the walls in this room. So we'll continue with worship now. Father in heaven, as we just sang, all I am is yours. We surrender all that we have, everything that we are to you, God. And we do that because, first, you're worth it. And second, Lord, we want you to be glorified. We want your will to be done. In this big faith series, last week we talked about big dreams. We don't want to limit you, Lord. And some of that means we might need to make decisions and take risks. So we take one of the biggest risks and we hand over our life to you to be used as you would, as you see fit. We also ask God today that you open our eyes, not, not just our eyes as a church, as a, as a community, a body of people who gather together in all the places that we've gathered, but Lord, especially, we ask that you open our eyes as a nation, as a world. And God, we ask that you open the eyes of individuals, that means me. That means each person who's hearing this right now. Awaken us, God. Awaken us to your will, to your ways, to your dreams, to your revelation. Reveal yourself to us this morning, Lord. We need to hear from you. so that we can follow. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand together? Lord, in this nation, 
awakening. Holy Spirit, we desire awakening for you and you.
Hey, Brad, could you help me with the lectern there? Well, good morning. How y'all doing? Okay, well, I'll try that again. Good morning. How y'all doing? Oh, that's much better. Know that you're here. Well, welcome. Uh, this week, two of the series that we began last week that we're calling Big Faith. And uh, the goal for this particular series is pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Our goal is that uh, wherever you are in your own personal faith level, and last week we, we took an assessment, at least hopefully you did that, and just kind of honestly thought about where you are in your own personal level of faith, from zero uh, being, you know, absolutely no faith whatsoever, to uh, 10 being like, you know, mountain moving, dead people raising, miracle working faith. And wherever you are or happen to be personally on that spectrum of faith, the goal is, is that by the time we reach next year, this time, that your faith is bigger then than it is now. That's the goal. And so uh, in order to help us achieve that, what we're doing is I'm just kind of giving you four habits that if you'll develop and nurture in your own life, um, I believe will help you grow in your own personal faith level and move it to a place where it's bigger than it currently is. You know, faith is kind of like a muscle. It has to be exercised, it has to be stretched in order to, to grow, and so that's what we're trying to do. And the reason that this is so important is because we serve a great big God who loves to do big things for his people and through his people. But here's the deal, is that we'll never experience the big things of God without exercising big faith. Um, in fact, uh, in, in Mark chapter 9, verse 29, it tells us this. It says, as your faith is, so be it unto you. I mean, that's just one of kind of the rules of faith. As your faith is, so be it unto you. In other words, uh, God will never disappoint us. That whatever it is that you expect from God, you know, if you expect God to do big things and you believe that he can do big things, you believe you'll see big things from God, then you won't be disappointed. You'll experience those things. But the, the converse of that is true, that if you don't expect very much, then you probably won't be disappointed either. You know, we, uh, Laura and I moved here from Kansas City, and we were right on the Kansas-Missouri border, and you'd see the Missouri plates all over, you know, the, the show-me state. And so people from Missouri are like, you know, I'll believe it when I see it. But when faith, as faith is concerned, it's kind of the opposite of that. We'll see it when we believe it. This is what faith is. And so this is what we're trying to do, is we're trying to grow our faith so we can experience the big things of God in our lives and in our church and in our world, okay? So last week, we began with habit number Number one, and that is, if you want to have big faith, then you've got to learn how to dream big. You have to dream uh, God-sized, world-changing, kingdom-building dreams. And if you missed last week, I really encourage you, go back and watch that message because the way that these habits work is they kind of build on one another. And you can't, you can't skip to number two unless you're doing number one. And so if you, haven't, if you haven't heard that or listened to it, I encourage you to go back and do that. But big faith begins by dreaming big, God-sized, world-changing, kingdom-building building dreams. But here's the deal. A dream in and of itself, as awesome as it may be, if it doesn't move beyond the dream stage, the truth is it will accomplish absolutely nothing. I mean, God, he could have given me the most awesome dream in the world. My planet in my heart from God's own heart. But if it never moves beyond the dream stage, it won't do anything to make the world any better than it currently is. It just remains a dream. This is why habit number two is so important because it is the vehicle that moves a dream from concept to reality. Habit number two is this. In order to have big faith, you have to not only dream big, but then the next step is, you have to be willing to risk big. You gotta risk it to get the biscuit, as Pastor Brad says. Now, he doesn't say that, I made that up, but he'll probably say it now. But, but you gotta be willing to risk big. You, you see, I'm convinced that just like small dreams are an insult to God, we talked about this last week, 
Small, just as small dreams are an insult to God, so is safe living. In fact, risk is one of the primary elements of faith. Ultimately, when you break faith down, faith is simply our willingness to step into the unknown. You know, we, we know that God, God's planted this dream in our hearts, and we have this idea of what it's going to look like if it's accomplished, but we have no idea between what's here, the dream, and here when the dream is realized. Last week, we, we talked about how we were created to dream. The, the Bible, in fact, is full of dreamers. But just as we were created to dream, I believe that we were created to live in such a way where we're willing to just lay it all on the line, knowing that if God doesn't come through, we're going to be in big trouble. We were created to live that way. This is repeated all throughout Scripture. The Bible is full. Just like it's full of dreamers, the Bible is full of risk takers. I mean, last week we talked about Noah. You take Noah as an example. Noah, you know, he's been given the dream of building this ark and saving humanity. And so what's he do? He takes a risk. He, he risks, first of all, wasting most of his life. I mean, uh, scholars tell us that it took Noah somewhere between 100 and 120 years to build the ark. That's a lot of life <laughs> that is dedicated to this one thing. And so he risks wasting his life. He risks wasting a whole bunch of resources. I mean, he takes all of this stuff, and not just his time, but we don't know, you know, where all this stuff come from. He, he had to pour a lot of himself into uh, procuring the resources to build the ark. And so here's Noah. If it doesn't rain, he's going to be stuck with a cruise ship with no ocean. He, he risks his reputation. People are looking at him and going, what in the world are you doing? You're building a boat in the middle of the desert. There's no, there's no ocean right here. And, and if it doesn't rain, he risks his reputation. He risks looking a fool. A Abraham is another great example of this. God gives Abraham the dream of being the father of a nation. God, God says to Abraham, he says, Abraham, I want you to leave, and I want you to go to the land that I'll show you. And at 90 years old, Abraham leaves the security of home, the safety of his home, and he goes off, not even knowing where he was going. You know, God says, go. And Abraham's like, go where? And God says, to the land I'll show you. And Abraham's like, you, God, you got to give me a few more details than that. Where is this land that you're going to show me? And God says, Abraham, you just go this way, and I'll tell you when to turn. And I'll tell you when you get there. I'll tell you when you've arrived to the land that I'm going to show you. And so Abraham takes the risk. He says, okay, God, that's good enough for me. And he goes, and he leaves the security and safety of home. Moses is another great example of this. God gives him the dream of rescuing his people from the bondage of the Egyptians. And so you talk about risk. Here's Moses. He steps in front of the most powerful man on the planet who has access to horses and chariots and soldiers. And Moses stands before him with nothing but a shepherd's staff. And he says to, to Pharaoh, looks him in the eye, and he says, God told me to tell you let my people go now. Your entire workforce, you let them go. I mean, you talk about risk. And we see this scenario that is repeated all throughout Scripture over and over and over again. Esther takes a risk. Daniel takes a risk. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego takes a risk. Peter takes a risk. Paul takes a risk. There, there's this scenario that is repeated over and over again all throughout Scripture. God places a dream in the hearts of his people. And then they take the risk to step out into the unknown, trusting that God will do what he said he would do. And the reality is this, is what is true for them is still true for us. It is that when, when God places this dream inside of us, we will never see the dream accomplished We'll never see that dream impact the world that we live in unless we're willing to step out into the unknown and take a risk. 
And so this morning, in order to hopefully encourage us to take more, more bold steps of faith in this, we're, we're, we're pointed straight into 2021. Uh, what I want to do this morning is I just want to look at three principles, three truths surrounding this whole idea of taking risks. Now, I probably ought to say this before we go any further, that when I talk about risks, what I'm not talking about is I'm not talking about living recklessly or carelessly. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about, you know, the attitude of, well, I can drive 100 miles an hour wherever I want to go, and I don't have to wear a seatbelt, and I don't need to put my kids in a car seat because I have faith God's going to take care of me. That's not faith. That's living recklessly and carelessly. We're not talking about that. There's a difference between faith and taking risks and living reckless and careless. When I talk about risk, what I'm talking about is when we make the decision that we will boldly follow God's instruction and his direction regardless of the circumstances around us and regardless of the obstacles that lie before us. That's what we're talking about. When God instructs us to do something, regardless of what everything else tells us, we're going to listen to what God says and we're going to step out and we're going to take a risk, okay? So principle number one, when it comes to taking risks, you need to understand this, that it is impossible to both play it safe and please God. It's impossible to, to, to play it safe and please God. You cannot do both of those at the same time. In Hebrews chapter 11, the great faith chapter, we read this verse last week, but the writer of Hebrews says this. He says, without faith, it is what? Impossible to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. In other words, if, if we choose to only operate in this space where, you know, I, I already know I can accomplish uh, whatever it is that's before me because I have enough talent, I have enough resources, I have enough wisdom, then the truth is I am not operating in faith because I don't need the power of God. I can do it all on my own. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. I think, I think one of the challenges for many of us that when we, when we think of faith, we're tempted to think that faith means that we're never going to have any doubt. That, that faith means, you know, that we don't ever have any questions. We never have a bad day. Now, it would be nice if that's the way that faith worked, but the reality is most of the time faith is way more messy than that. Faith, you see, it's, faith is not the absence of doubt. Faith is simply a decision to push through all of our doubts. In fact, the truth is, faith is not really faith until it's challenged. Real faith is, is simply the wrestling that takes place between these are the circumstances that I see around me. These are the obstacles that I see before me. This is the impossibility that exists. But God said. It's the wrestling between all of this and what God said. Last week, I talked about what I called the crisis of impossibility. Anytime that God plants a dream in your heart, that is so big that you know that you're never going to be able to accomplish it on your own. And so you decide in faith to take a risk and step into the unknown. I'm telling you, you better be prepared because you're going to be confronted with those moments when all of a sudden you look at, you look at your talents, you look at your resources, you look at your circumstances, and the thought hits you, this is impossible. I mean, it's... It's crazy. This is absolutely crazy. But here's the deal. You'll never experience the joy and the thrill of God working in and through you without stepping into situations where it looks like, this is crazy. A few years ago, Laura and I were still living in Kansas City and we went to, to Worlds of Fun. 
Some of you probably remember when uh, they used to have a night where the Nazarene church would rent the entire park and they'd have Nazarene night at Worlds of Fun. Anybody remember that? Some of you. Yeah, well, Laura and I, uh, we used to go to that. And, uh, you know, our idea of a fun time at amusement parks are um, bumper cars and, and uh, funnel cakes, you know. Um, that's, that's fun for us. We watch the shows. We pay $20 for a corn dog and a Coke, and we call it a night. We had a great time. But this particular year, we happened to be walking around the park with some uh, other pastors that we were on staff with, and we came upon this attraction that they called the Rip Cord. Anybody ever heard of the Rip Cord? Some of you have, yeah. They call it a thrill ride. Um, but for those of you who are not familiar with what the Rip Cord is, is um, the Rip Cord is this, again, ride, and I'm using that term loosely, but it's this ride where they'll strap you together, like three of you can go on it on the same time. And what they do, first of all, is they take individually and they strap you in this, um, I, I don't know, the best way to describe it is it's like a combination um, girdle slash straight jacket. But they lace you in this thing so you can't escape. And then once you're laced into the girdle slash straight jacket, what they do is they put you in this other device together that I, I don't know the official name for it either. I call it a death hammock. But it's like this big hammock that they wrap around the three of you and they somehow tie it in the back so now you're stuck. You can't get out. And then what they do is they take this clip and they, they take a rope and they affix it to the death hammock and there's a winch at the top of this tower and they like pull you up slowly several hundred feet up in the air. And then once you're up there, there's the rip cord that one of you are supposed to pull and the clip releases and you literally free fall. You fall, 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 fall until you're just a few feet from the ground and then the, the, the cord is supposed to catch you and then swing you gently and beautifully over the park and then you swing back and you just gently swing back and forth until you finally land back on the landing pad. Well, we, we, had, we had been there, and we, we had watched for about 20 minutes, you know, these uh, brave idiots who were doing this. And um, all of a sudden, our lead pastor gets the bright idea that the three of us pastors ought to do this thing. Now, he's a lead pastor, and we're just, you know, we're staff pastors, we work for him, and so as a staff pastor, whenever the lead pastor comes up with an idea, you're supposed to, as a staff pastor, go, yeah, that's the greatest idea I've ever heard, right, guys? That's what we do, yeah. So, so, so he's, he comes up with this idea, and the other pastor immediately, he's a worship pastor, and worship pastors are the worst, because they work in cahoots with the lead pastor. I mean, they plan the services and they're like in this thing together. And so the worship pastor, he's only like 25 years old too, on top of everything. He's like, yeah, let's do it. And they both look at me. And my first thought is, you suck up. Um, but they're looking at me and like, I'm the deal breaker on this thing. I mean, they're waiting for me. And so I'm like, yeah, yeah, let's do it. And so, you know, um, we have to wait, and we go sign up, actually, and, and, and here's the other deal. When you sign up for a ride, you shouldn't have to wave or sign a waiver. Amen. It's like, yeah, you're signing this thing that basically says, if we kill you in some fashion over this thing, you're not going to sue us. And this is supposed to be an amusement park. There's nothing amusing about that. But we, so we sign the waiver, and we wait our turn, and so finally it's our turn, and um, they take us in, and they put us in the girdle straight jackety thing, and then they strap us together in the death hammock, and then they clip the rope to the back, and, 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 and slowly we begin our ascent. It is crazy. <laughs> that's the thought that's going through my mind, is this is crazy, all the way up. This is crazy, this is crazy, this is crazy. One of the things that I learned is that it looks way higher up there looking down than down here looking up. All the way up, the people keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and that's the thought I'm having through my brain is this is crazy, this is crazy, this is crazy. We get to the top, and I'm not sure what the other pastors are doing at this point in time because I'm having some alone time with Jesus. 
And I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm rededicating my life to him. And I'm searching my brain. Is there any unconfessed sin in my life? And so I'm like confessing stuff I never did just in case. You know, I'm not sure if I did that or not. And so I'm having this alone time with Jesus. And all of a sudden I feel this nudge. And the worship pastor, again, worship pastors, the worship pastor nudges me and says, are you going to pull that thing or not? Yeah, it's on my side. Nobody told me that I'm the one that's going to be responsible for the death of these three pastors. And so, so you know, I had this one last thought. This is crazy, but I pull the ripcord and down we free fall. And it was crazy because something happened in that moment that as we, as we fell, there's something inside of me that switched from this is crazy to this is awesome, <laughs> And then we, we went down, and man, it caught us, it swung us up, we swung over the park, we saw everything, we swung back, and we saw everything back here, and we saw it up here again, and, and it was like all three of us couldn't contain it, we're like, this is awesome, this is awesome, and so we get down, it's done, they unstrap us, I walk over, Laura knows I don't like heights, and so she says, how was it, and all I could say was, it was absolutely awesome, in fact, I did it three more times. It was so awesome. Listen, I, I tell you this um, mostly true story <laughs> because that's the way faith works. The, the truth is, is that we'll never experience the this is awesome moments where God is at work in our lives without the willingness to step into and press through the this is crazy moments. This is the way that faith works. I think one of the greatest examples of this is um, Peter from the Bible. You know, there's, there's a story about how Peter and the disciples, they're out on this boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee and Jesus is not with them and there's a storm that comes up. And the storm is so bad that they don't think that they're going to be survive, you know? I mean, they're terrified for their lives. And all of a sudden, they look out into the storm, and off in the distance, they see what they think is the image of a man walking on the water. And they're like, you know, their logical mind says, people can't walk on water, so they conclude it must be a ghost. And so now they're more terrified than they were before. But, but as this image gets closer and closer and closer, they realize that it's Jesus. They recognize his face. They recognize his voice. And Jesus is like, hey, guys, anybody want to go for a walk? And you guys know the story, right? That, that, that all of them except for Peter, you know, I, you can't tell me that they all didn't have the same thought. This is crazy. People can't walk on water. And all of them but Peter stay in the boat. Peter gets out of the boat and he presses into the this is crazy in order to experience the this is awesome because he actually walks on water for a minute. And then, you know, of course, he takes his eyes off of Jesus and he sinks. And normally when we talk about that story, we're kind of hard on Peter because we're like, don't be a Peter. You know, don't, don't, don't uh, take your eyes off Jesus in the storms of life because you're going to sink. And that's true. We don't want to take our eyes off of Jesus anytime, especially in the storms of life. But I think Peter, Peter gets an unfair shake because, come on, he was the only one who had enough guts to take the risk and step out of the boat. And Peter experienced this, this is awesome moment because he was willing to take a risk and step out of the boat. You see, the truth is that when it comes to Jesus, most of us, we want to play it way too safe. And we allow our own fear The the fear of failure, the fear of what we don't know to keep us from stepping out of the boat. But here's the deal. If you really want to experience the awesome things of God, and come on, who doesn't? If you really want to experience the awesome things of God, you've got to be willing to leave the safety of the boat in order to experience the awesome things of God. Whatever your boat is, you say, you know, what's going to happen if I get out of the boat? I don't know. All I know is you got to step out to find out. You'll never find out unless you step out. You cannot play it safe and please God. Principle number two, if you're taking notes, is this. If you need a guarantee, you're not walking by faith. 
If you have to have a guarantee, you're not walking by faith. Again, I want you to look at what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 11, 1. He actually gives us the biblical definition of faith. He says, faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us the assurance about things we cannot see. Faith is what? It's the confidence of what we hope for. Notice, faith does not begin with a guarantee. Faith begins with is hope. You know, I, I hope I'm hearing God right. I, I hope that if I take these, these steps that I sense that God is leading me to take, things are going to work out. I hope. We have to understand, however, that biblical hope is really, it's different than what we typically think of when we think of hope. What, what the normal kind of hope is, you know, I'm hopeful, but it may not happen. The, the writer of Hebrews says that biblical hope, however, is the confidence that what we hope for is actually going to happen. That's the hope that we have. The problem for most of us is we want a guarantee, even biblical hope, the confidence that God will do what he said he would do. I mean, he's got a pretty good track record, that God does what he says he's going to do. But but that is even not enough for many of us. If the truth were to be known, we want to guarantee, you know, I think I heard from God. I I, I believe that he's wanting me to take this step, but I'm not going to take it unless I have a guarantee that when I do, things are going to work out the way that I think they're going to work out. You know, I need to know for sure that this is going to work. I need a guarantee. Listen, If I'm really honest, I'd have to confess that for the majority of my life, this is the way I live my life. You know, I'm not willing to risk much. I, I had to... I had to calculate it all out. I had to think about it ahead of time that whatever I was going to do was a guarantee. And, and I, I really, I can't tell you when or how that started, but I was thinking about that this past week, and I was thinking about all of the things that I missed out on. I was thinking about when I was in high school. I always loved basketball. I loved, I, I loved basketball, but I never went out for the team because I was afraid that if I did, I wouldn't make the team, and I, was, I allowed fear of failure to keep me from something that I know I would have enjoyed. And what's crazy about it is, is that, you know, we, we, when we would have like the basketball unit in our gym class, I would play one-on-one with a bunch of the guys who made the team and started for the team, and I beat them, I could hang with them, and, but yet I wouldn't go out because there was no guarantee, Doug, if you go out, you'll make it, and I totally missed out on something that I know I would have enjoyed because I wasn't willing to try it because there was no guarantee. I believe that there's some who are watching today, some of you who are here this morning, and you can identify with what I'm saying because the truth is, that's how you live most of your life. If there's not a strong guarantee, you're not gonna move. Gotta gotta calculate it all out and gotta make sure that I know that these are the steps and every step is a guarantee. I'm sure that I'm gonna make it. And you don't attempt anything that you're not convinced ahead of time that you already know you have the ability, you have the resources, you have the talent to accomplish. And as we talked about last week, the truth is that the older we get, the more true this is. Because now, you know, the older we get, the more we accumulate, the more we have to protect. This past week, I had lunch with a, a, a friend of mine. He pastors a church here in town, and uh, we become good friends. And we had lunch together, and this pastor, we were talking about this very thing. And um, the, the, the church, it was planted about six years ago, and God's really blessed them. They've grown, and just recently, they were able to purchase their own building. They'd been meeting in a, in a school up to this point, but we were talking about this very thing, about faith and risk and fear and guarantees, and this pastor said, man, I just had this very conversation with our leadership team the other day. He said, I, I had the conversation because I noticed something. I noticed that now we own a building We're already developing the tendency to want to play it safe because now we have something to lose. Before, we didn't have anything to lose. He he said, when we began, man, all we cared about was the mission, the mission, the mission. We knew what God had called us to do, and we were willing to go for it, man. We were willing to swing for the fence regardless of what the cost was because the truth was we didn't have anything to lose. 
He said, but now we do. And already, I've noticed that as a result, we're not as willing to swing as we once were. And so he was challenging his people. He said, man, I had a uh, meeting with my leadership team, and I said, guys, what got us here? I I think they saw something like 300 people give their lives to Jesus Christ in the first couple of years of their existence. But he said, guys, what got us here was that we were willing to step out on faith. We were willing to risk it all for the sake of the mission of God. And he said, if we stop doing that, then we're probably going to just become another church institution in the city of Lincoln where people gather once a week and kind of do their spiritual thing and feel good about themselves because they came to church for an hour and a half or something like that. But the truth is, we really don't have an impact on the world around us. Thought about that and thought about a couple of years ago our district superintendent, uh, Dan Cole, invited one of our general superintendents to do a training uh, for the, the pastors on our district. So Dr. Gustavo Crocker came, and his topic of the day was the lifespan of a church. Do you know that churches have lifespans? That just like people have lifespans, churches have lifespans. And he, he talked about how that typically when a church begins, the one thing they're consumed with is, man, they are just so consumed with the mission. You know, this is what God has called us to do, and so whatever it takes, we're gonna do like what my friend was talking about. You know, we're just gonna swing for the fence and allow God to use us however he wants. And, and it's during this season of a church's life where the most rapid growth takes place. Kind of like, again, like my friend's church. But he said what typically happens is the natural progression in the lifespan of a church is that as a result of the growth, you know, many churches, they began meeting in schools or uh, civic community centers or theaters or whatever, but but as they grow, their resources grow, and so they, they do what most churches do. They get a building. They create programs. They become more organized. And as a result, there tends to be a shift that takes place that is unintended, but the natural shift is that they move from being mission-focused to maintenance-focused. We can't take the risks that we once took in order to further the mission of God because now, I mean, come on, we have all of this to protect and to guard, and we don't want to lose it. And there are no guarantees that if we step out and do what we believe God is calling us to do, you know, we won't lose everything that has taken us so long to gain. And Dr. Crocker said that right now this is being proven over and over and over again. That what happens is that when a church shifts from mission to maintenance, they stop growing and they begin to decline And as a result, eventually die, most of the time, a painful, slow death. Man, can I just tell you that as your pastor, that's what keeps me awake at night. Now, it's not the fear of losing everything. I mean, come on, everything that we have is God's anyway. It's not ours to lose, (laughs) It all belongs to him. And so it's not the fear of losing everything. What keeps me awake at night is the fear that we become so protective of what we think is ours that we'd rather hold on to it. And if the truth is known, watch the world around us go to hell, then risk it in order for them to experience the same forgiveness and healing that we're supposed to have experienced. And here's the deal. What is true for an organization is true for an individual. The the reality is the church is not the building. It's comprised of individuals. And the truth is, if we're not careful, we individually can become so protective of what we have that we refuse to step into the more that God has for us. 
Some of them, you probably have seen this before, but a long time ago, they did a study, I think it was with chimpanzees, and they, they gave them something that, you know, that they were attracted to. I don't know if it was marbles or candy or what, but they grabbed a hold of it, and, 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 and they had another bucket over here with more of it, and they wanted to reach in and grab it, but they couldn't get their hand in it because of the fist that they were making, because they were holding on so tight to what they already had, when there was way more over here for them, but they couldn't grab a hold of it because they were holding on so tight to what they already had. Man, we do that. We do that, and when we do it, we miss the more that God has for us. Listen, the bottom line is this. You can have faith, or you can have control. But you can't have both. You, you can have faith, you can walk by faith, not by sight. You can live in such a way where, where God has these dreams, he plants in your heart, and then he begins to fulfill those things through your life, and you experience the this is awesome moments. Or you can have control and play it safe and stay where you are, but you can't have both. Sometimes you just have to say, you know what, I think God is calling me to do this. I think this is what I heard God say. And I'm not really sure how it's all going to work out, but I'm just going to go ahead and get out of the boat, trusting that because I love God and my heart is right and he loves me, that he's not going to let me drown. If he needs to redirect me a little bit, I'm going to listen to him because I'm, I'm following his voice anyway, and I'm taking it step by step by step. You see, I believe in 2021 that God has some great things in store for you as an individual, and he's got some great things in store for us as a church. But here's the deal. In order to be a part of what God wants to do, that can only happen if we're willing to release control and step out of the boat, take a big step of faith. Can, can I just tell you that that as a church, we're, we're going to do some big things this year. In fact, the truth is that I believe we're being called to some things that honestly, I don't know how they're going to turn out. All I know is God has placed some big, God-sized world-changing dreams in the heart of our leadership team. And I don't know how he's going to pull them off. I just know that he will because he's God. God is a big God who is capable of doing big things far more than we can even think of or imagine. And listen, I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but I believe that God has placed some massive dreams in some of you. And, and you, you've been looking for, waiting for a guarantee, you know. God, what's this going to look like? If I take step one, what are steps two through ten going to look like? Listen, if you read through Scripture, I don't ever find a place where God works like that. Over and over again, God gives this dream of a preferred future, a, a redemptive mission. And he says, this is step one. He doesn't show step two until we're willing to take step one. And he doesn't show step three until we're willing to take step two. And the truth is, if we really want a guarantee, the only guarantee that we need is that God is God. <laughs> That's your guarantee, that God is God and he'll always be God. And God has a perfect track record and he always has and always will proven, has proven himself to be faithful. And so if you ever want to experience this is awesome, you got to step into the this is crazy. You can't play it safe and please God. You, you can have control or you can have faith, but you can't have both. And then principle number three, this is the last one. You cannot step towards your destiny without first stepping away from your security. You can't, you can't step towards your destiny if you're not willing to step away from your security. Abraham is the perfect example of this. Again, in Hebrews 11, verse 8, it says this. It says, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place where he would later receive his inheritance, he obeyed and went. And then notice this. 
even though he did not know where he was going. <laughs> Abraham took the risk. I love that. Abraham, he obeyed, even though he didn't have a clue where he was going. All he knew was that God said, go. And so he was willing to leave the safety and security of home. He took the first step, believing that at the right time, God would show him step number two. Listen, here's the deal. This is why this is so important. That when we take that first step, Keeping our eyes focused on the author and the perfecter of our faith. Guess what? All of the sudden, by his power, we are walking by faith and not by sight. Which is how we're created to live. This is how we're supposed to live. Whenever we give our lives to Jesus Christ, we are created to live not by what we see, but by what God says. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Oh, but here's the deal. Great faith thrills the heart of God. When, when God's people exercise great faith, I just believe God is like, oh man, uh, to whom little is given, they did a whole lot with it. They invested it. They used it. They, they, they believed. And so I can trust them and I can give them more. I can trust them with more. Because as your faith is, so be it unto you. And so the question is, how does this play out in all of our lives? Again, I believe that this next year is going to be a year where God is going to speak to some of you. Maybe he's doing it right now. That God is going to speak to some of you. And many of you are going to take a big step of faith. You're going to take a risk. Maybe for some of you, you're going to share the good news of Jesus' love for the very first time with somebody else. Somebody who needs to experience what you've experienced. And come on, it's a risk. And you're gonna step out and you're gonna share your faith with somebody who doesn't know Jesus. And regardless of what their response is, because you were willing to take the risk, God's gonna grow your faith. It's gonna be bigger than it was before you shared your faith. For, for some of you, you're gonna begin tithing for the very first time. I mean, you heard about it, you thought about it, and you've made excuses. But this year, you're going to step out in faith, and you're going to do something that on the surface looks absolutely crazy. You're going to take 10% of what you have, and you're going to give it to God through giving it to the church. And as you do, what's going to happen is you're going to discover that God has this way, that God's math is different than our math, that he can take 90% that he blesses and make it further than 100% that you hoard. And as a result, your faith is gonna grow. This is how it works. Our faith has to be stretched and exercised in order to grow. For some, I believe that there's a ministry inside the church, maybe outside the church, that's been burning in your heart for a long time. And this year, what you're gonna do is you're gonna take a step of faith and you're gonna step into this dream that God has placed into your heart. And you're gonna see God work in you and through you like you've never experienced before. And you're gonna experience, as a result, more excitement, more joy, more fulfillment, more satisfaction than you've ever felt before in your life. And the capacity for your faith is gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger. Why? So that God can do more through you. Because that's what he wants. He's the God of more. And let me say this, as a church, whatever else is going on in the world, whatever the circumstances or the obstacles are, COVID, political unrest, economic uncertainty, as a church, we are not going to shrink back. We're going to dream big. Hear me on this. We're going to dream big. Why? Because God did not call us to a small commission. He called us to a great one. Because he's a great God. And he can do great things. 
And when God looks at you, and when he looks at me, when he looks at our church, I want him to be amazed at our faith. And not amazed at how small it is, but amazed at how great it is. Come on, anybody want that? I believe with all my heart that this next year, God wants to do exceedingly, abundantly more than anything that we could ask or think of or imagine. How? according to his power that is at work in the church so that he would be glorified for generations to come. So my question is this. I mean, all of this is pointing to a question. Will you join me in that? Are you willing to step in to that? And, 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 and could we do this? If you're willing to step into it, could we hold each other accountable? And I want to say this publicly right here, and it's on video, so it's, it's going to last forever. <laughs> Is you have permission, you have my permission, as your pastor, to hold me accountable. You have my permission to come to me anytime and say, Pastor, you're thinking way too small. <laughs> You gotta think bigger. You gotta dream bigger. God's a big God. You gotta dream bigger. You have my permission to do that. But at the same time, I wanna tell you this. What you do not have my permission to do is you can never come to me and say, Pastor, you're thinking too big. You're dreaming too big. Because it's impossible. We, we can't dream bigger dreams than who God is and what he wants to do. How many, how many here this morning want a bigger faith than you already have. Doesn't matter what your faith was last week, you just want it to be bigger. Man, good. Me too. I, I want my faith to grow. And for those of you who are watching online, if you're there, man, hit the heart button. Just say, I want my faith to get bigger. Just, just let us know that you want your faith to grow. And again, it doesn't matter what our faith was last week. The past is the past. What matters is where do we go from here? We want to live bold or dream bold dreams. We want to pray big prayers. We, we want to see people healed, see marriages restored, see people set free from sexual bondage. We want to see families that have been broken come back together. We want to see people who are around the world um, go without, be blessed with the things that they need. But that can only happen by dreaming big, world-changing dreams and taking big risks. So let's do it. Let's dream big. Let's risk big and then see what God does. It's gonna be exciting, isn't it? Father, this morning we come to you. We believe that you're the dream giver. <laughs> We believe that you have the ability to do exceedingly, abundantly more than anything that we can do on our own or even collectively. Whatever synergy we can create as a group of people, you, God, just by speaking a word, can do more than what we can do on our own. And so, God, I pray that you would trust us. Trust us enough to plant big dreams in our hearts. And then God, on our end, our commitment to you is if you give us the dreams, and I believe that you are and you have, then we're gonna take bold steps of faith. We're gonna, we're gonna risk it to get the biscuit. <laughs> we're gonna step out and we're gonna watch you work. And God, I pray along the way, I know that we're gonna face those crises of impossibility where in our minds, it's like, what did I do? This is crazy. In that moment, help us to keep our eyes on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. We can't even perfect our faith on our own. We need you to do it. And so, Lord, I pray that you would. Father, this morning, I believe that there are some within the sound of my voice and the risk that they need to take is that very first one, and that is, and it's big. It's just taking their life out of their control and placing it in your hands. And so this morning I pray, Father, for those who are wrestling with that, like, what's gonna happen if I do that? I don't know, all I know is it's gonna be awesome because you're an awesome God. So I pray you'd help them to make that decision right now. God, I give you all that I am. 
I place my life in your hands. I ask you to be the forgiver of my sins and the leader of my life. Plant big dreams in my heart. Help me, Father, to live into more than what I can do in my own. I want to be a part of something valuable and important, something that lasts for eternity. And so, Lord, I pray that you would lead us in that way. Thank you for those who made that decision this morning. I believe that somebody did. We're excited about what this next year holds, Father. Our hope is in you. Our trust is in you. Our expectations are high because you're a big God who does big things. And so we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said together, Amen. Let it be so. Amen. We say that together. Can you stand to your feet this morning? Can you stand and can we say that together using our hands? Just say amen. Thank you, God, for that dream. Let's sing together as we go this morning that all I, yes, all I am is yours. Let's commit that as we sing this morning.